How do I mount my antennas here at home? How much discomfort are you willing to go through for a POTA activation? And why would we want to use hammers versus a regular logging software for Parks on the Air activations? This time on Mailbag Monday. What's happening, everyone? Thanks for tuning in to Ham Radio Tube. My name is Mike, K8MRD. If you have an amateur radio-related question for me, shoot me an email, K8MRD at iCloud.com. I'd love to hear from you. Today, we've got three great questions, so let's dive right in. This first question uh, talks about how I mount my antennas at home. He says, love your videos. I was curious as to how you permanently mount or deploy your NFED half-wave antennas at your house. I want to do the same thing and need some inspiration. So, great question. Um, there's there's no one answer for this, but I'll but I'll kind of tell you the first thing: <laughs> make friends with your neighbors. Um, so, I live in a small little cul-de-sac. Uh, there's only four houses here, so we're kind of a little tight-knit community, if you will. There's only one antenna that I have. Uh, that's actually connected to my house. One antenna goes over my house and is connected to uh, my, one of my neighbor's trees and goes across my house to my other neighbor's tree. And then one is attached to my house and goes across the street and connects to the neighbor out there. Uh, so let's take a little field trip and I'll show you exactly how I do it. So here we can see the tree that the first NFED half wave is in. We'll zoom in there. There you can see the transformer and I just threw a rope as high as I could, got it over that branch and there's some paracord going down. I'll show you in a minute, but that antenna goes all the way across into that tree and is tied off to a fence there. I'll show you that. And then my neighbor is a ham and that's his VHF mast. And you can see right below the white antenna, that kind of white box, that's the other transformer. So that's at the base of his antenna. And then the wire for that goes all the way across the street into that tree into my other neighbor's yard. So if we take a look at the first antenna, the transformer, the paracord just goes all the way down to the tree. And like, you, you gotta just kind of figure stuff out in the Hamley way. But this tree just happened to have a couple uh, branches cut off that made a cleat of sorts. And I just wrapped the remainder of the coax or the, the paracord rather around that. And uh, yeah, some people say don't use paracord. It disintegrates over time. And yeah, it can uh, after years. And I mean, I'm here in Texas, you know, maybe, Maybe every two or three, four years, uh, it'll start to get brittle and you might replace it, but paracord is so cheap, it doesn't matter. And it's so strong. So it's tied to this tree on one side. And then over there, we'll walk back there and I'll show you how that's tied off. But I basically got on my roof and I threw my arborist throw line over the top of that tree which is the same thing I did with that. I just hucked my arborist throw line up there, tied the paracord to the arborist throw line, and then pulled it back down. That's how I got the paracord over. So let's walk over here and I'll show you how I have this tied off. So here we are. You can kind of see maybe the wire right there going into the top of this tree. And then I have paracord going down somewhere. It's grown up quite a bit in the last probably year since I've been back here, but as we go into these bushes, <laughs> none of this stuff was here. Uh, here's the paracord, and there's a fence behind my house, and I utilized that fence, and I just took a carabiner and attached it to the fence there, and then just put a little knot with a loop, and uh, here's all the rest of the paracord just wound up nicely. So that way I can raise and lower the antenna pretty darn easily. Just come out here, unclip it from the paracord. Uh, I'll just untie this uh, loop really quick and let out the rest of the paracord and down she goes. And it's pretty much the exact same thing for the second antenna. They're both 10 antennas, uh, antennas, 49 to one. And that's going over to this tree. And again, we just threw uh, an arborist throw line over the tree hoisted the paracord uh, back over and 
somewhere in this tree. I haven't been over here in a while. Yeah, we've just got it. Uh, we've got a doingy on this one. So <laughs> you can see it's kind of jacked up, but we had to bring the paracord coming from down uh, from up top. And we had to route it over more towards the trunk of the tree. And then uh, I didn't do this one. My neighbor Michael did. Just got it some doingy on here. And uh, that's it, yeah, just find a way. Hams will find a way. What is it, nature will find a way? Hams will find a way. So that's how I do it. And I guess I'd get this question if I didn't show it. The coax, you can see, is just drooping down there. That's Messi and Poloni uh, Ultra Flex 7 Sahara. And then it just kind of lays on the roof, as it were, and towards about the middle of the house you can see here we have it coming off i've got my hf and my vhf coax so the thinner one is the hf the thicker one is uh, ultraflex 10 sahara and we got it kind of tied off there on the uh, eaves there just coming down a little bit of a droop so water doesn't get in got a few toroid wraps on there and then i just drilled into the mortar of the house and this is the uh, uh, the antenna that goes across the street. This is my VHF UHF, and this is the uh, antenna that goes over the house. So that's how I do it. And this is a close up look at the antenna that I'm using. This is an older version. They come in white now, but the paracord goes through this hole. That's how it's being held up. This is where you attach your radiating element. And if you have a keen eye, you might notice that I had some strain relief. I actually modified this. I drilled a hole and I just put like an eyelet and a bolt. I, I took the cover off and I bolted an eyelet onto that and uh, just did some strain relief so it's not just pulling right off of this and uh, the coax there and seal it up and everything. This is if you want to put a counterpoise on, you can. I don't have any counterpoise. Coax X is the counterpoise in my case, but uh, this is what I'm using. They are awesome antennas, so go check out 10 antennas on eBay. So now you know, like I said, get creative. Uh, if you have room or if your neighbors have room, <laughs> make friends with them. <laughs> Don't start arguments. <laughs> so be, be friendly and uh, maybe you can do just the same. So thanks for writing it. I appreciate the question. Always happy to show my antennas. Next, we got a question about comfort levels and pod activations. This viewer writes, and this is a whole long email. I'm just trying to kind of summarize, but he lives in Georgia where he goes uh, to the park, which is about 10 miles away from him, uh, from where he lives. Uh, the weather can change quite a bit. And he's talking about activating right on a river somewhere in Georgia. And uh, his question is, uh, how much discomfort and inconvenience will you tolerate to have a POTA activation or a similar radio field activity? As a rule, I don't like being uncomfortable when having fun, but I had promised to test out a prototype antenna for a friend. And here's a picture of that. Uh, bottom line, I froze my ass off at a POTA activation, but still had fun. Well, there you go. That's that's the name of the game right there. Just have fun. But he's trying out some uh, kind of antenna and maybe pressed for time. So, yeah, I get it. So there's a reason I moved to Texas from Michigan. Um, I don't like the cold at all uh, and will do everything in my uh, abilities to not be cold. So moving across the country uh, was one thing that I did, but I, it depends on the situation. Like if I'm just here at home, like right now, it's a gray, gloomy day. It's a little windy. It's 67 degrees. So like it's warm, but uh, and it's actually St. Patty's Day. So I might actually go out and do one. But uh, I've been in many situations where and I'm talking when I lived in Michigan, like all winter, like I, I pretty much didn't go out because I don't like being uncomfortable and being cold. But sometimes I still did. If it's a nice sunny day, you know, the sun does keep you warm. Uh, we don't see that much in Michigan. So a lot of times I would just go out and set up, you know, back in the day I, I was using like a Wolf River Coils. Um, and you could just run a coax to the antenna, run that coax into your car, just crack the window and sit in the car and activate. And then you don't have to deal with the wind or the cold or anything. Even if you don't have the car on and the heat on, just that kind of greenhouse effect. If the sun's coming down on you, you're out of the elements and, and you can kind of stay warm a little bit. But other times like winter field day, my very first winter field day was minus 15 degrees. It was a nightmare. That was like the first and only time I ever wore like long underwear, two layers of socks, 
uh, all all kinds of bundled up. But we did. Uh, we were in a trailer that had a heater in it and stuff, so we were able to to stay uh, a bit comfortable. But uh, generally, if it's like really windy or rainy, I just don't go out. But if I'm, say, in another state, I'm traveling, I want to activate the park, I'm going to do whatever I got to do to get that park activated. Whether I'm comfortable or not, it might not be a very long activation. But, you know, and again, if I can sit in my car, I mean, I've got a mobile radio and, and uh, you know, the ATOS on it, so I don't even have to get out of the car. But, uh, yeah, I'm not too keen on, on being out in the weather uh, when it's uncomfortable. I love being outside and I love doing parks on the air and, and put those things together is great, but I don't want to go to the park on a crappy day and be uncomfortable just to do a POTA. So, uh, yeah, for me, uh, I'm not willing to go through very much uncomfortable pleasantries uh, to do a POTA. But guys, what do you think? Leave your comments. Do you get out there when it's crappy? I know some of you guys are way hardcore and uh, will pretty much do just about anything. So that's my answer. Uh, <laughs> but have fun. Get out there and play radio. Or don't. Lastly, I got a question about uh, a user that's using Rumlog for uh, his logging software, as do I for Mac. And he's asking, couldn't you just use that for POTA? And uh, why would I want to use anything else? And his question is, I'm a bit confused on how to upload a file from L Rumlog NG to the POTA site. Would you consider making a video on how to use it for POTA? Well, yeah, that's easy. So I'll show you that, but I also want to show you why you might not want to use a regular logging software for parks on the air versus using hammers and why you would want to use hammers. So let's hop over to Rumlog. I'll show you how to export the contacts. That part's easy. So here we are, Rumlog NG. This is just my main log, but let's just say you're using your main log or you created a new log, it doesn't matter. Um, but let's just say you're using your main log. So I'm gonna say, let's take all these contacts from March 2nd here. And I'm just going to simply click the top one, select it, scroll down, hold shift, and click all those, okay? Then I can go up here to logbook, and I can export selected QSOs as a diff. So we're going to click on that. And then I want to name it, and I'm going to name it in the conventional POTA naming. So I'm going to say K8MRD at, let's say I was at Kilo 3019, and it was on... March, uh, let's see, it was on 2024, March uh, 2nd, okay? So that's what I'm going to name it, and I'll just save this file to my desktop, and there, we're done. And here we can see there's that file. So now we can go over to the Parks on the Air webpage, and we're just going to hover over your uh, call sign, assuming you're logged in. Go to My Log Uploads, click right there where it says click here to drag and drop your ADI ADIF files. And there's that file, and if I double click that, there you can see there's the 25 contacts, and you can hit upload, you know, check these boxes here and hit upload, and you're pretty much done. That's it. Even if you were at a two first, so let's take this and let's duplicate this log here, and let's rename it, and let's say I was at uh, Kilo 009. I'll get rid of this copy word save that so now if i was at a twofer i can just drag both of those in there and now you can see there's 3019 there's 3009 obviously two different parks that are nowhere near each other but you could upload that as a twofer and both of your logs would be uploaded but now let's take a look at some of the reasons why you might actually want to use hammers as your portable logging software and then just import your log into rumlog when you're done so now here you can see we're in hammers and you can see I've got nine QSOs entered in here, just random QSOs. And over here in Rumlog NG, I have the exact same QSOs entered and you can see I have nine QSOs. So let's say you're like really struggling to make that 10th QSO. Maybe it's been a half hour since your last contact. And let's say I work uh, NU8M and I put them down here. Rumlog is going to tell me right away if it's a dupe because we're on the same band in the same mode. Now, if I worked them on 20 meters phone and 20 meters CW, that's a different thing. That'll count as two separate contacts. But if I go over here and type in NU8M, it's just going to add John down there. And here you can see I've got a contact with him there and a contact with him there. Yeah, we have 10 QSOs, which technically is a park activation. But when you upload this log, 
it's going to take that dupe away and you're only going to have nine for your activation and you won't actually have successfully activated. But because we know that he was a dupe, we can say, oh, hey, thanks, John, for working me again. Unfortunately, you're a dupe and you know you still need one more contact to make. Another thing, if you're working, somebody comes back to you as a twofer. Let's say we work Whiskey 5 Kilo Victor, our good friend Johnny over at Signal Search, and he is at a twofer. Let's just say he's at Kilo 1, 2, 3, 4, uh, and he's at another park. All we have to do is hit a comma and no space, no nothing, and then let's say he's at Kilo 1, 2, 3, 5, whatever, okay? Then we could hit Enter. Hammers automatically makes two contacts for us, so we know, okay, we got him as a twofer, we got his park information, and we don't have to make another contact, whereas over in Rumlog, if we work Whiskey 5 Kilo Victor, I just put the park notes, uh, the park uh, designator in the notes here, let's say he's in one, two, three, four, then you hit enter, and then you got to make another contact with him, and put Kilo 1, 2, 3, 5, and make that contact. So it doesn't really matter. You honestly don't have to enter in their other parks because he's the one at the twofer. So he's going to upload it and you're going to get credit for it anyway. So it doesn't, again, it doesn't really matter, but it's just nice to have these things here. Another great thing about POTA, let's say we're still trying to get that 10th contact and we're calling CQ, we're calling CQ and we're just not making it. Well, Hammers has this POTA spots tab. This is everyone that's working a parks on the air right now. This is live. So we can say, okay, maybe Whiskey 6 OGX uh, on 14313. Let's try and hear him. We can just simply click this button that says copy. It puts all their info in there. You can throw your uh, call out there. And if you end up working them, hit enter. There he is. There's the park number, everything done and done just like that and you can you can just keep hunting parks like this you can sit out there all day and just hunt parks if you want let's kf8 aji uh let's see if we can work him all right we just got him in the log hit enter have it selected there hit enter and then there he is in the log it's that easy on rum log yeah we've got this cool spotting cluster but these aren't poda activators which doesn't matter like here's one here where did he go uh 24 970 here's kc1 SRI, he's doing a POTA, so maybe you can work him. Hit enter. There you go. He's in your log there. So you can do it either way. It's honestly a personal preference. It doesn't matter one way or the other. But then from Hammers, let's say we're done. We can go to our log books. We can uh, click the gear here, hit export ADI. And let's just rename this. Let's say I was at 3009. Whoops, Kate, I'm already at kilo 3009. 2024, uh, what is today? 0317. And I'll just save that to my desktop. And then again, we go over here to our uh, act upload activator logs. There's that file I just saved. There's the 11 contacts and I can upload it. So either one works. I just think having an app specifically for parks on the air just makes things a little bit easier. So do whatever the heck you want. Honestly, the only thing that matters is the band, the call sign, and the time when you upload it. So not a big deal. But again, the nice thing about hammers, if we want to duplicate a log, we can simply go over here and hit duplicate. And this is going to allow us to change uh, the name. Let's just change that to test copy two, sure. And here we can change our park right there. Hit save. And now we can go back to logs and here's both of those logs. We can export these separately. Save that to my desktop. Save that to my desktop. And here they both are. Go over to the POTA page. There's those. And there you can see both park numbers again. And then if we want to import that hammers log into rum log, we're only going to import one of them because otherwise they're gonna be duplicates. So we would simply go up to logbook, import ADIF, and we're gonna find there's that ADIF, double click it, hit import. It just imported those QSOs, hit finish. And then here's those 11 contacts that we just uploaded. And then from there you can upload it to uh, logbook of the world or whatever, logbook of the world, EQSL, wherever you want, done and done. So Hammers just kind of makes things easier by design. 
None of these are hard. It's just a few mouse clicks, but do whatever you want. <laughs> Get out there and have fun playing Parks on the Air. That's the name of the game. So thanks for writing in. I hope this helped you. And guys, if you have questions for me, shoot me an email, k8mrd at icloud.com. Thanks for watching another episode of Mailbag Monday. My name is Mike, k8mrd. This is Ham Radio Tube 73.